Yes, hello, everybody. Uh, first question from the Football Programmes website is, do you enjoy reading non-league programmes? So I'll go first and then David can pick up. Um, yes, I do. It's really part of the non-league experience to pick up a programme on the match day. It's the first thing I look for when I arrive at a, a football ground. Quite often, um, I travel long distances all around the country to watch matches and I get there maybe two or three hours early. And the first thing I do is go and buy a programme uh, so that I don't miss out because I like to keep them for my collection. They are a, a keepsake uh, in every way. You look at the date of the match, you look at the, the cover, the club logo, the club history, and it's all in the programme. And programmes, I've got thousands and thousands of programmes, and every programme I pick up and look at now sparks a memory. From matches I went to as a, as a kid, um, I used to go and watch Hendon Football Club regularly. They were my non-league team when I was a little boy and um, I look at the old green covers and the date on the cover of the opponents and I can remember things, I can remember who I went to the match with, if I went with my uncle, if my mum dropped me off outside, if I went with my school friend Johnny um, and we used to, to go to Hendon and run around and try and touch the match ball when it was kicked over the, the perimeter barrier and we used to throw it back and I can remember all these things from, from the programmes and some clubs um, it's a real labour of love. I went to St. Helens Town two or three years ago and the programme was sort of 84 pages and there were all sorts of historical articles that had been written by different people at the club. And uh, I think non-league programmes are fantastic and I, I really do hope that they continue because at the moment, a lot of clubs are going to online versions, which is understandable in the pandemic because people don't want to be picking up pieces of paper and, and passing loose change across. So non-league programmes, part and parcel of the game. Even as a kid as well, every club in the Isthmian League that I used to go to would have a club shop and people would congregate an hour before the game at the club shop, swapping programmes, buying programmes, picking up programmes. People used to collect one programme of every non-league club, A to Z. And I've still got a, a collection of, of a couple of thousand that I haven't even been to, clubs that I haven't been to, but that I picked up at club shops, defunct clubs and, and so on. And uh, I think less and less people are collecting non-league programmes now, but I hope that non-league programmes continue. How do, how do you feel, David? Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Um, spot on, Tony. Um, excellent answer there. Um, echo all of, all of your thoughts um, on non-league programmes. Like you say, it's a really staple of, of going to football, isn't it? Whatever level um, you go and watch a match at. Um, you touched on it there. It's, it's a wonderful resource, isn't it, for for learning more about clubs and history of of clubs and perhaps what's going on at, at the moment. And you know, you look at uh, even at, at the top level in the Premier League as, as a journalist, as well as as we both are, you, you can get wonderful snippets of information that maybe come out of a of a manager or a, or a player's notes in the program or a chairman or an owner. Um, and, and they're a brilliant resource from that perspective. Like I say, it's you know you go to football and, and a football program is one of the things <laughs> you expect when you when you go to a ground, really, isn't it? Obviously, at non-league level, it, it is tougher to to bring out a program. I think there's, there's printing costs and time and effort that, that has to go into these things. Um, I think we've, we've got a question a little later about the future of non-league programs um and, and maybe we'll, we'll talk about um what lies ahead for them but i, I think just generally about, about football programs it really is a, a a wonderful thing about the game really um it's a it's, it'd be an interesting one to look into the origins of, of, of non-league football programs tony do, do you know much about much about that what why did why did non-league football programs start well the original aspect of a programme, it was a programme of events. So if you went to a match and you wanted to know the team lineups, you had to buy a programme. When I was a kid, um, it was before the internet, you had to buy a programme to get the fixtures, to get the league table, to get the manager's notes and so on. You could only get that through a club programme. And um, nowadays, of course, with the internet, all of this information is available online. And that's why people have perhaps stopped collecting programmes. But as I said about visiting St. Helens Town, they made their programme different. They made it in a way that the content couldn't be found anywhere else online. So all the historical articles, all the interesting 
pieces by supporters who have been following the club for years and years and years. It had a homespun uh, content, but a professional presentation. And it was really, really good. And that's the way forward for football programmes. I think you've got to make them different. Attractive covers, startling covers. Some clubs have a, a cartoon on the cover or, or something like that just to attract people to buy it. And then the content has to be something different to what you can find online. But yes, the original programme were a programme of events. Uh, it would even tell people the kickoff time, what dignitaries were in attendance and so on. And, and some of those very early programmes, non-league programmes from before the war are, are worth in excess of £100. So um, going right back to the, 19, the early 1900s and the 1910s and the 1920s, those programmes are, are worth a lot of money. So uh, a big interest in non-league programmes. And long may they continue, David. Absolutely, I echo that for for sure. And um, as I say, a, a big part of going to football and, and and going to a game. Now, let's move on to our second question from uh, Georgia Cook. Thank you for getting in touch. Uh, Georgia says, "How big of an impact does non-league football have on yourself?" Um, well, firstly, obviously, it's it's a big part. Uh, in my life for, for sure um, you know for starters obviously working for the non-league paper it is what I do for a living so clearly um, I have to have quite a large interest in it and, and, and be following it every day and night um, and and all week really right up until a Saturday night when the paper goes to print so it's it's certainly non-stop there's never a day when you aren't checking Twitter or a club website or haven't been sent something from a club um, or, or looking at the latest news as to what's going on. So it, it definitely has a big impact. In, in terms of watching non-league football, um, before I started with the non-league paper, um, I would regularly go and watch Woking. They're, they're my team. And that was the only football I would I would go and watch. I don't support a Premier League team or a Football League team. Um, you know, it was it was purely non-league and, and woking. So, from a match-going perspective, uh, non-league was certainly the only thing I did really, and and very much sort of my introduction and and life in terms of going to football has has always been non-league. Um, you know, it's not to say I haven't, I haven't been to higher-level matches, but regularly on a Saturday afternoon, I was either at Kingfield or somewhere. Up in the higher up in the in the country, following following the team, and uh, yeah, certainly it certainly had a, a big impact not only on on working life, but but also social life as well. You know, a lot of my friends now um, I've made from supporting the club. I play for a team on a on a Sunday morning that is purely from other working fans, which I wouldn't be a part of without without the football club. And you know, I think you almost take for granted sometimes when you when you go to the team you support in non-league or you, or you go to your go to watch your team and the, the amount of people you you get to know and almost get to know is 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 perhaps uh, an exaggeration because it might just be a nod or a smile to someone who you you, you regularly see but the, the people you you get involved with and at these games it, it's brilliant and um you know you really do very quickly become part of a, a community and, and, and part of something, I think. Um, which certainly, I think before I started following Woking and, and going to watch their games, that wasn't something I'd, I'd experienced before. I hadn't been going to, to other matches or, or anywhere like, or anything like that. So that, that's been a big part of it for me as well. I think a lot of match-going fans would say that often the football and the scoreline actually gets in actually spoils the day sometimes it's it's more about being with your with your friends and, and you know traveling to gateshead or a, or a south or, so, or something like that and uh, and enjoying the day um so that's that's the impact it, it has on me tony what about you yeah some great points there david and i would echo all of those i mean looking back to when i was a kid and i started going to my local teams which were hendon the old finchley football club barnet when they were pre-football league and Edgware Town and Kingsbury Town. It was always a safe and, and friendly environment. My mum could drop me off at the turnstiles with my friend from school, Johnny. We could we could turn up sort of 10 minutes before the game, go in. It was affordable. It was only 5p to get in in those days, which was affordable on our pocket money. We could uh, stand where we want. We could run around and keep warm. And people would look out for you. It was like a family. So 
this was in the 1970s when there was terrible uh, football hooliganism at the bigger grounds, the football league grounds um, around London. But it was always safe for us to go to Hendon Football Club. There was never any trouble. And uh, we could get a, a sausage roll for 5p. We could get a programme for a couple of pence. It was affordable football. It was really, really nice. And over the years, as I continued going to non-league, I decided to try and visit every non-league ground in London. And then I decided to visit every non-league ground in the country, which I'm still trying to do. It's taken years and years and years, but there's no rush because I don't want the hobby to end. But what I find now is the community aspect, the friendliness of it continues. And the volunteers are fantastic. You, you turn up at a game having traveled a long distance. So you get there really early, two or three hours before, and the volunteers are already there. They're already in place putting up the nets, marking the pitch out, making the teas and coffees, putting the kits out for the players and so on. And those volunteers will stop and give you a friendly welcome and tell you all about their club. And they talk to you in great detail and great pride in what they're doing and what they're doing in the community with their youth teams, their women's teams, their disability teams and so on, their soccer schools, their academies. And that's the whole essence of non-league football. It's community football. And I think it's, it's just great and it's, it's great to go there and be part of it. And I think that the modern football fan who just follows the Premier League and just watches football on television. Uh, OK, football on television is great, but those modern football fans are missing out on so much enjoyment and so much involvement in their local community football club. And that's why non-league football is special, the friendliness and the community involvement which um, makes it a cup above the rest. Um, before we move on to the next question, I think we should um, welcome everybody who is um, attending at the moment. Alan, Brian, uh, John Cotton, Kit Owen and Russell Cox. Nice to have you all on board and you can ask a question um, using the question and answer function. Okay, let's look at the next question, uh, which is from David B. How does non-league propose to attract new followers? Well, I think it's very important uh, going forward from the pandemic and once fans are allowed back in, that non-league football doesn't rest on its laurels uh, because clubs have missed out on so much income over the last year that we've been in this pandemic, this terrible pandemic. Obviously, friends and family and loved ones must come first. We haven't been able to play a lot of the time or we haven't been able to have fans in. The clubs have, have missed out not just from the money through the turnstiles, but the money through their clubhouses and their sponsorship has been decimated. I mean, those clubhouses, it's not just what they take over the bar, it's what they take from renting out the facilities, from wedding anniversaries, from uh, birthday parties, wedding receptions, bar mitzvahs and so on. All of these events that take place maybe six, seven nights of the week, particularly at the weekend at non-league clubs, the clubhouses are very, very busy. And that's what funds non-league football and, and clubs have lost out on all this revenue. So to go forward, we've really got to step our game up and, and get new fans in. And I think that the, the affordability of non-league football is the drawing point, really. Um, if you went to a Premier League game in London, places like Arsenal, I think on a match day, I've looked it up and, and tickets can cost more than £90. So if you add on the cost of travel or parking, um, a burger, a drink, uh, a program, um, and, and maybe for a family man, if he's got a child or a couple of children with him, it's going to cost a match day, day out in London at a Premier League game is going to cost in excess of £100, maybe in excess of £150. Now, the working class person, I'm a working class person, I know that if I was growing up now, my family wouldn't be able to go and watch top flight football. And we did when I was a kid, not only did I go to Hendon, but I obviously support Queen's Park Rangers. Queen's Park Rangers were in the top division then, the old first division, nearly won the league in 1976. But it was affordable. It was just about affordable. We had to economise on going on holiday or, or luxuries like that, but we could afford to go. And I don't think we'd be able to afford to go now if we were going to Premier League football as a family like we did when I was a child. So non-league football going forward, what I'm suggesting, I suggested it in a column in the non-league paper, is that you have one flat price for your whole day out. So if you take, for example, non-league steps five and six, which is the FA bars level, normally it's five or six pounds admission 
on a match day for a club in the FA Vars, in the Bill Base FA Vars. Now, what I was suggesting in the non-league paper column is that for clubs at that level, for example, your whole day out costs, say, £10. So for £10, you get your admission to the game, you're handed a programme and you're handed a voucher. And that voucher you can take into the clubhouse and get a drink and something to eat. You can get a drink and a burger. So your whole day out costs £10. Your parking is included as well because most non-league clubs, you don't have to pay for parking. And so everybody knows how much it's going to cost football for a tenner. And I think for children, to get the children involved, you say, right, the company children admitted free with an adult or maybe a pound, just a nominal fee. And I think that's the way forward to exaggerate and exacerbate how affordable it is and let everybody know. So higher up the pyramid, steps three and four, um, obviously it's going to cost more than 10 pounds. Maybe your whole day out costs 15 or 16 pounds. And then for the National League at steps one and two, uh, maybe your whole day out costs 20 or 25 pounds. And the figures could be decided, but but then you would do a, a, a global um, publicity campaign with a hashtag, for example, football for a tenner. Every non-league club at step five and step six uses that hashtag on their social media, on their websites, on their turnstiles, football for a tenner. And that, I think, is the way forward to attract new followers. How do you feel, David? Yeah, you've hit the nail on the head there. Tony, obviously the, the big aspect really and, and attraction to, to non-league football is the affordability. And just going back to the the, the previous question about sort of the impact non-league football has had, and I, I think that is part of it. Like like you said, obviously if you're going to your local non-league club, you're you're probably local. Um, so so you'll be home if you're you know if you're a youngster like like I was back in the day. You, you know you're getting home at a, at a reasonable time. Um, it's affordable for you. Um, and and you're in a in a an environment that that you know really I, I suppose and yeah I mean looking looking ahead the the affordability of it is is the big thing I mean I'm hopeful that once we get through the pandemic we'll see a a boom in in attendances and a, and a boom for non-league a little bit like we did in August and October obviously capacities were limited at that time um, but I felt that people were more inclined to go down to their local non-league club and, and perhaps spend a, a little bit more on, on you know maybe in, in the clubhouse or or on other on other things and I, and I hope that will be the case again um, once things get back to normal obviously that will be the same for a lot of other industries but I, I really hope that local people will come out to their non-league grounds and I, and I can see that happening um, but like you say, I don't, think, I don't think there's too much more to add really on, on this topic it is the affordability and, and keeping it simple like your idea there, Tony, is probably the key. It's, it's very marketable, that, isn't it? Football for a tenner. Um, it's easy. Everyone knows where they stand. Um, and, and it's just a simple idea. And it's probably maybe just worth adding as well. It's Clubs do do things like this. It's, you know, it's rare that you come across a club that isn't offering... Um, some sort of entry deal for under 16s or kids go free with an adult or, or something like that so I think perhaps it is sometimes just looking and, and maybe inquiring before you go as, as to what's going on but certainly clubs are welcoming in, in these in these offers um, and I think that will be the key uh, going forward but like I say hopefully once we're once we're through this, uh, normally can see a, a boost in, in attendances. Um, anything to add on that, Tony? Before we move on, you've also touched on a couple of other good points there. I mean, the um, ease of access is is also a very good plus point for non-league football because if you wanted to go to a Premier League game, you'd have to book tickets. Maybe all the tickets are sold out. It's very, very difficult to park. I know parking around the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium, it's £20 to park in different car parks and so on. Um, and you're herded in, you have to sit in your seat and so on. Whereas if you go to non-league, you can turn up maybe 10 minutes before, you can park outside, you just go through the turnstiles, you pay money, you go in. You can stand where you want as well. You can move around and chat to anybody. You can sit down in the stand if you want. Uh, you can get a drink and a, and, and a pie without too much queuing up. You know, there's all this uh, ease of access is another real plus point for non-league football. And of course, the football itself isn't too bad. I've seen some really good games at non-league level, fantastic games, uh, wholehearted commitment, 100% tackling, no rolling around, no play acting 
and uh, some exciting football. And the, the, the best competitions, of course, are the knockout competitions, the FA Cup, the Bill Base FA Trophy, and in particular, the Bill Base FA Vars, my particular favourite, because on paper, any team that enters the Bill Base FA Vars, any team has got a chance of getting to Wembley. And we've seen some very small clubs get to Wembley in the past, um, like Rainworth Miners Welfare, Renneth, they're called, in the local area. Um, it, it's harder now because the Northern League clubs have dominated over the years, but that has changed a little bit. So um, lots of really good positive aspects of, of supporting your local football club. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, now then, let's move on to Michael Ivory's question. Michael says, I think it's safe to say that every, everything non-league level three and below is done again this year. The National League will go ahead as it directly feeds into the Football League, he, he uh, thinks. Uh, but does, but do we think the National League North and National League South will conclude? Um, so this is the big debate at the moment, really, in, in non-league, isn't it? That's steps one and two about what will happen with the season. Um, as things stand, there is a vote with clubs um, at the moment on whether to continue the season or to render it null and void. Uh, those clubs are currently voting. Uh, we should be hearing the result of that vote pretty soon. Um, I would have thought the vote would be in this week, but it hasn't happened yet. And, and some time's ticking before the weekend, so we'll have to see. But um, yeah, the, uh, the the vote at the moment is for, for people who don't know, which um, uh, it's quite sort of a, a complex sort of thing. It's, it's sort of almost <laughs> two votes within a vote. Um, they're effectively voting on whether to split the two steps and decide on their season separately. So if that vote is passed, then the National League clubs will decide on their own season and the National League South and North clubs will decide on their season at step two. Um, that I think is is likely to happen. I think I think resolution one will be passed, and then it will be the case of seeing which step continues. I think step one will finish as normal. Obviously, there will be some fixture pile up um, going into the later months. So the weather at the moment is is not good. Clubs like Dover, I think, have had fifteen matches postponed through the COVID or or, or weather and pitch related issues. So that will be something there will be games on thursday evenings and, and monday nights and whenever there is spare time to answer the question of what's going to happen at step two this is the the tricky one really and this is where it sort of hangs in the balance i think at step two there is a majority of clubs who want to continue to play i think there's over half clubs at least are intending to play on with the season um, the issue is in the north, really, where it seems like most clubs don't want to continue the season. Um, and it could well be that because of that majority in the north, it means the south has to come to an end. Um, and it's, uh, But I can't call which way that's, that's going to go at the moment. It, it's, it's very much in the, in the balance. Some clubs have got their votes in already, some haven't. Some, I think, are waiting to see whether they will get a grant from Sport England and how that process is going at the moment. It's a very tricky situation for clubs. And I think looking ahead, the outcome of this, there will be clubs up in arms that they wanted to continue the season. And if it is made null and void, then they'll be furious. Um, they'll have probably issues of sponsorship and, and, and things like that. And perhaps you know local businesses might want their sponsorship money back um seeing as the season didn't finish if the season goes ahead there'll then be an issue of clubs not wanting to play as we're seeing at the moment um and not having the the funds to do so either so it's an impossible situation to please everyone um it's a sad situation that we're here now um having a vote on this um and it's certainly been a, a very difficult start to the year for, for the National League in, in terms of um, the situation that these clubs find themselves in. Um, 
so I think we'll just sum up from that on that answer. I think that step two will be made null and void. I think that does look like the way it's heading. Like I say, it is in the balance of it. But I think that's just my my gut feeling. That's just how I felt throughout the last couple of months. Um, and I think step step one will continue, which will obviously mean there won't be relegation from step one, won't be promotion from step two, and, and there won't be relegation from step two either. Um, so that's where I stand on it, Tony. Yeah, it's difficult. I mean, it's all down to this vote, isn't it? And I think one of the main talking points is that I think clubs thought that they were going to get grants and now um, they did get grants earlier in the season, didn't they? But now it looks like it's going to be loans that they're being offered and there's all sorts of debate about this. And if they take these loans, then they'll have to pay them back in the future. And some clubs are saying, like, we, we won't be able to pay them back in the future because obviously if they use those loans to pay their players, uh, they won't be able to pay the money back and the, the, the clubs will be in jeopardy. So it's a very, very difficult situation. I can see all different sides of the argument. Obviously, as we said before, friends, family and loved ones must come first in this pandemic. So we can't risk health and safety and so on. But on the other hand, um, it, it feels very safe. I've been to quite a lot of football matches this season behind closed doors. It feels safe. Um, there are a lot of COVID safety procedures at the moment at football grounds. And I think if the lockdown is lifted um, later this month, there's going to be a big announcement by the Prime Minister on the 22nd of February. If the lockdown is lifted, say, in March, uh, we could carry on playing. But I can see all sides of the argument. And um, the, the, obviously, as I said, the, the health and safety aspect must come first, but also the future of our football clubs is paramount as well. We don't want to see any clubs in the National League or the National League North and South go into financial difficulties because they overstretch themselves by taking these these loans. And um, I think that is the case, David, isn't it? There's been a, a, a sort of a, a big debate about whether or not these would be loans or grants. Yeah, that's right. That's the, the big sticking point is the, the grants or loans uh, issue. Um, Obviously, for October, November and December, the, the National League were given £10 million by the government, via the National Lottery, to play matches behind closed doors and, and make up for that shortfall that they, that they would get from fans coming in. Um, during that period, there was issues for some clubs over how much money they received. Some felt that they didn't receive enough and, and felt that others received more than they needed. Um, and then the way the government works is that they review funding over in three months in three month periods. So the funding was guaranteed for six months and it was being reviewed after the first three, because it could have been the case that January came and crowds were back in and, and things were back to normal. Obviously, that wasn't what happened. Um, so the funding was then reviewed and then it was it came out that the DCMS would be providing this money um, via loans. Uh, which is obviously the, the, the sticking point for, for clubs. The National League say that they were promised it was going to be grants. Uh, the DCMS say that that was never the case. Um, so there's been somewhere along the line some, some miscommunication there, which is uh, clearly quite a, a large and, and severe mis miscommunication in, in terms of this season and, and the impact that has on the clubs. Um, and that's effectively how we've, how we've come to this situation now. Um, it seems like the um, the decision for, for it to be loans, that won't be overturned, there, there won't be a U-turn in terms of now offering grants. Um, Sport England are offering grants to clubs who are in real dire straits, um, and there is a process for that. The problem is, is that those clubs don't know whether they'll get that grant at the moment so how can you vote on continuing the season without knowing that that grant money is, is going to be arriving it's, it's a gamble isn't it so I think clubs who are in that situation don't want to be relying on something that they that they aren't sure might arrive um, which has led to many to, to voicing that they want the season to be made null and void um, so yeah, it's a, a far from ideal situation and, and sort of a not very nice one there either, really. 
Okay, let's move on to the next question. By the way, we've got a number of uh, attendees in the room. So just a reminder that you can ask a question using the Q&A function on the screen and we'll be pleased to hear from you. The next question is from Stuart Cripps who says, is it time to restructure and bring in more regional matches and setups? Well, that's an interesting point from Stuart because obviously local derbies attract big crowds at every level of football. And um, going back to the old days, you'd always play your biggest local derby of the season on Boxing Day and you'd always get your biggest crowd. I can remember Bedworth United playing Nuneaton Borough in the Southern League in, what was it? It must have been the late 70s. And they had over five and a half thousand there for a Southern League game on Boxing Day. It was incredible. Um, I've, I've even seen, I've gone to certain games at, at Step 7. And when there's a local derby, there's many Step 7 clubs who only normally get two men and a dog. So all of a sudden, they'll, they'll get over 100 there. The, the, the best place, I think, that regionalised football could come in would be um, at the bottom end of the Football League, where League 2 at the moment could be split into a League 2 North and a League 2 South and absorb all the uh, leading clubs from the, the National League. And it was uh, it was regionalised until the late 1950s. There was the Football League Division 3 North and there was the Football League Division 3 South, all local derbies. And certainly um, if the National League clubs were absorbed into the Football League, it would make a, a lot of sense, uh, more local games and, and so on. Uh, instead of um, a club right down in the South, like... Um, Exeter having to travel up to Barrow or whatever in, in the Football League, you know, there'd be, there'd be more local derbies. It would be Exeter against, well, it would be Torquay, wouldn't it? Torquay would come in um, from, from the National League if the National League became absorbed into the Football League and, and so on. And um, Barrow could play more local games as well uh, against Gateshead and, and teams like that. Uh, I certainly think there is an argument for more regionalised football. I think if we're going to make major changes in the football pyramid, maybe now is the time to do it because going forward after the pandemic, we're going to need new ideas. We're going to need new initiatives. Uh, it, it's going to be like the, the period immediately after the, the Second World War where everybody was getting back to normal. And I think when we write the history of football from this current period in 50 years time or 100 years time, people will reflect on the post pandemic period in the same way as people currently reflect on the, the post-war period. It was a very specific and special time in, in the football annals. And I think the next five years that we're going to face now will be viewed the same. How, how do you feel, David, on, on regionalised football? Yeah, it's an interesting point. Obviously, the FA were planning to complete their restructure um, at the start of next season, which would be the 2021 to 2022 season. Um, to set up a more pure pyramid they, that they called it whether that will still happen now with um, obviously all the, 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 the I suppose postponements and, and delays to this season and, and the problems we've had so far I'm, I'm not sure whether that will still go ahead but um, it will be coming at some point so that will, will regionalise the non-league pyramid a little bit further. But it was a very interesting point you made there, Tony, and, and one I was going to bring up about regionalising League Two. Um, I think probably my argument as well would be that the National League now is effectively a, a full-time professional league. There's only a few clubs in there who are still part-time. Um, and by... League Two effectively swallowing up the National League and, and having those two League Two North and League Two South leagues would put things on a par for those National League clubs, really. And then National League North and South would, would become effectively step one of the non-league pyramid. Um, and I think that would then sort of balance things out a little bit more in terms of the professional and semi-professional aspects that we're currently seeing at, at steps one and two. I think that was the issue the National League has as well at the moment is that, you know, you look at some step two clubs and, you know, with, with respect, they're very traditional non-league clubs. And then you look at the likes of Notts County, for example, in, in the National League and, and they are poles apart. And you, and you kind of think, you know, how can we be judging those two teams or those two clubs on the same sort of level under the same league bracket um, as each other. Whether 
if that did become the case, no, you could you then remember. argue. Sorry, go ahead, uh, David. Sorry, <laughs> um, I, I think then you could argue that uh, National League North and South would then get to a stage where it was became more professional like the National League has and there'd be more teams that are full-time. And then you think, well, then should it become a... a then should that then be swallowed into into the football league? It's sort of like where where do you stop? Um, but clearly there are those discrepancies at the top of the non-league pyramid. Um, I don't think I'm really sort of answering the the, question, <laughs> the actual question um, too much here, but it's difficult to to restructure at the same time in the sense that there will always be clubs that have to to, to travel. I mean, you know, geographically there aren't loads of sort of step three clubs within the same area. I think probably no matter how you do it, there will always be those long, long trips. It's probably more a case of work, of clubs working with leagues to say, look, if we're going to be going on a two, three hour trip, let's make it on a Saturday afternoon rather than a, a Tuesday night. And if we have to reschedule, let's try and do everything we can to, to get it on a Saturday again. And to be fair with leagues, you know, I've spoken to, guys like Mark Harris, the, the chairman of the Northern Premier League, and, and Nick Robinson at the, at the Isthmian League, you know, they understand that and they, and they do work with clubs. It, it's the same as when one of their teams has a, a good run in, in, in the trophy or, or the FA Cup. They'll, you know, they'll always cancel a midweek fixture before that big game on a Saturday just to, to give them a boost, really. So I, I think leagues are aware of this, but again, it, it is a problem that I think that's what will always stay with non-league, but there are certainly things that, that can be done. And I think, you know, going back to the, the National League um, idea with, with League Two, it, it would certainly be a big change. Um, but I think perhaps, like you said, Tony, after this period that we've been through in, in the game, perhaps now is the right time to be perhaps pressing, pressing the, the refresh button, in, in a sense, and, and looking at those sort of things. And think more on that one, Tony. Um, I think we've we've covered that, but we have a question that's coming from within the room from John Cotton. Uh, we've got a number of people attending this meeting, and we're pleased that they're with us and <clears> um, <throat> encouraging them to ask their questions. So, from John Cotton, he says, "We have a women's FA Cup. Should there be a women's FA Vars and women's FA Trophy in line with the men's competitions?" That's a great question from John, and I think the answer is yes, because. The development of the women's game is happening very rapidly now. The, the FA Women's Cup is becoming a, a really big competition. And um, it will only ever be won by, by teams in the, uh, the Women's Super League, uh, which is so strong now. So, yes, we do need a women's FA trophy and a women's FA bars eventually. And I think there would be a commercial benefit in having that. Sponsors would like to get involved because it would be real grassroots football for the women's game. I see the development of the women's game a little bit like the development of rugby union, which was maybe 20 odd years ago. Um, until then, rugby union was, a, was an amateur game and, and top matches only used to attract crowds of, of a couple of hundred. And all of a sudden it became professional. It was sponsorship, advertising, really good TV coverage, really good backing from the media. And now the, the top uh, rugby union clubs get crowds, five bigger crowds and uh, very good publicity, very good wages and so on. And I'd like to see the women's game move forward. And I think it will because I've got a, a two year old daughter who is currently downstairs kicking a ball around in the lounge and she loves playing football already. And if in 15, 20 years time, she gets the chance I'm not saying she will become a footballer, but if the opportunity is there for her to become a professional footballer uh, and the, the game at women's level continues to expand like it is at the moment, I think in 20 years' time, the, the wages and the publicity and the crowds at women's games could be equaling what we see in men's football. It, it certainly is in America where the, the top women footballers are multimillionaires and uh, media personalities and so on. Now, if we get this continued expansion of the women's game over the next 20 years that we're seeing at the moment in this country, then uh, in 20 years time, my daughter could become a, a top professional footballer and, and I'm all for it. What, what do you think, David? Yeah, spot on, Tony. I think the, the women's game is certainly growing, isn't it, like you've said. And 
particularly in, in non-league now, clubs are um, forming women's sides, and 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 and, and many are, in, are embracing embracing that. So, an FA a VARD and an FA Trophy um, is certainly the way to go. I don't see any reason why not to to bring that in. To be honest, it's another opportunity for competition. Um, yeah, it seems like a certainly like a good idea to me. Um, let's move on to a question that came through on Twitter from uh, Change the FA Cup, uh, who says, is it time for the FA Cup qualifying rounds were expanded to allow for an additional 200 non-league teams to enter? Um, so I presume this is uh, those clubs at step six and, and some below who, who don't get the chance to enter the FA Cup at the very early rounds. Um, I think that the problem with this is, is just timing um, and, and getting those fixtures in. Uh, the first round of, first round proper of the FA Cup uh, is always televised and for, for broadcast regions it's usually in, in the first week of November and effectively all the ties up to that point have to be have to be completed and, and then got in by that weekend. Um, so there's always a little bit of a rush and a bit of a scramble to get the get the fixtures in, uh, which we, which we particularly saw this season. Um, you know, with a lot of seasons starting late, I think you know a lot of clubs were almost playing FA Cup ties uh, every week to try and to try and fit them in. Um, in a regular season, the FA Cup extra preliminary round, I think, starts in, in August, in very early August. I think I remember going to Sutton Common Rovers in an extra preliminary tie last season, um, which was which was which might well have been their first game of, of their campaign before their league season had even started. Um, so I think by adding more teams, I mean, it's, it's a great opportunity for those clubs, absolutely. It's just more of a logistical thing and getting those matches in. I think you'd, you'd have to be going back into July further to try and get them in and, and playing them effectively in, in pre-season. Uh, so that, I think that's the issue that, that's, that's facing the competition with that one. Absolutely. I mean, I love the FA Cup. Um, when I was a kid, it was the greatest cup competition in the world. It would be lovely to have more and more non-league teams in it because the magic of the FA Cup is with the non-league teams. But David's right. When would you start these games? You'd have to have extra, extra, extra preliminary rounds to get all the games played. And it would be, yeah, they'd have to play them in June and July. Um, as David said, um, some non-league clubs, the FA Cup is now currently their first game of the season. Is it fair for them to play what is potentially one of the biggest games of their season as their first game of the season when they've not had a competitive game? It's very, very difficult. But Looking back, um, when I was a kid, the FA Cup, the, the magic of the FA Cup is all about the non-league size. I can remember the great cup runs of, of Altrincham, um, some upsets from, from Enfield, Blythe Spartans getting all the way through and playing Wrexham in front of 40-odd thousand at St James's Park, Newcastle. Amazing. Uh, Stafford Rangers played one game. They had to switch it to Stoke City's ground. There were 31,000 there. I think Enfield took Barnsley to a replay. And that had to be played at White Hart Lane. And there were over 30,000 there. There were huge, huge crowds involving the non-league clubs. And even if you look back to when the famous game when Hereford beat Newcastle, there were 18,000 inside a non-league ground. I mean, that wouldn't be allowed now. But um, great, great memories. And that's why I love the FA Cup so much. And um, yes, even nowadays, it's all about the non-league clubs. Um, because when the Premier League clubs come in in the third round, they play their reserves and it waters down the, the glory and the, the magic of the FA Cup. Uh, it, once the last non-league club is knocked out of the FA Cup, that's when the magic stops. And uh, we've seen great coverage this season for the non-league clubs in the FA Cup on TV. The, the coverage has really stepped up and it, it's been great. The only thing that I don't like is that as soon as our non-league clubs reach the FA Cup first round and as a televised game or whatever, all of a sudden they become butchers and bakers and candlestick makers, which we never mention. When we go to see a non-league game, we never sit there and think, you know, if I'm watching a game in the Isthmian League or the Northern League, I don't think, oh, there's a builder there and he's just passed to a plumber or whatever. These are all great um, build-based trades and the players should be respected for their commitment because they go out and do a day job and then they 
they train in the evening or they play a match in the evening and they've come straight from work. Some of them are covered in paint or whatever when they arrive or they turn up a little bit late looking flustered and they go out and, and give a magnificent performance on the pitch. And I think that we should respect our part-time non-league footballers, our tradesmen uh, and, and so on and respect them rather than just start identifying and patronising them when the FA Cup comes around. Um, let's, let's just respect our non-league footballers and in the FA Cup, they are footballers and they're giving their best and we should just watch them and think, yes, that's a footballer playing football today. So uh, that, that's my viewpoint on that. Um, right, the next one, uh, number seven from Mr Up. When did you first fall in love with non-league football? Well, I think I've already touched on this. Um, I think we both have actually, but to recap, because people are joining the room that weren't here at the start. My first memories were at Hendon Football Club at the old Claremont Road in the 1970s. It was the post FA Amateur Cup period and Hendon had one of the best teams in the country. I can remember the, the, the team, the players, John Swannell in goal, Rod Hader was the captain, Peter Deadman, Alan Phillips, great team, Kieran Summers up front, great, great non-league amateur team. And I fell in love with non-league football because of the reasons we've already said. It was affordable, it was local, it was convenient, and it was a friendly atmosphere where I could go as a 10-year-old uh, with my friend from school and we could run around and, 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 and get involved. And we saw some great games there. And, and Hendon, I mean, people at school used to, to laugh at me because I was going to watch Hendon uh, because they were, even in those days, they were armchair Liverpool and Manchester United supporters at school. But all of a sudden, Hendon got through to the third round of the FA Cup, got drawn away to Newcastle, went up to St. James's Park and drew the game, one all, in front of the 30,000 crowd at St. James's Park, which was a big crowd in those days. And Rod Hader scored the equaliser for Hendon. And they, they, they took Newcastle back for a replay. It was, it was played at Vicarage Road. There was a five-picker crowd there. OK, Hendon lost that game. But all of a sudden, everybody at school was asking me, oh, what's it like at Hendon? I see they've drawn Newcastle. they held Newcastle to a draw and people were sitting up and then the next Hendon home game, two or three friends from school who'd never been before all started wanting to come to Hendon. So they were, they were great days and um, great memories. And it set me on a path of, of following non-league football all my life. And um, I, I think David, you're entrenched in non-league with your, your love of Woking as well. And it, it really is an acquired taste. I mean, I don't think somebody could, um, it would be very difficult to suddenly start acquiring a knowledge of non-league if you hadn't been brought up in the game as a kid. Although, as I said, we are trying to encourage new people to come along. So, um, yeah, it, 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 you, they'd need a, a refresher course or a catch-up course to, to understand <laughs> the nuances of non-league and to enjoy the game like we do. But um, your early memories were, were as a youngster as well, weren't they? Yeah, very much so. And I, I think almost what's quite nice about starting uh, at that time effectively starting to support a, a club is each week you go along and, and you start learning who the players are and you and you start learning the, the names of the left back and the goalkeeper and um, and then suddenly you, you go along to an away game at, at Welling and, and all of a sudden you're, you're just having a little chat with the goalkeeper before the game and, it, and it's very personable in, in that aspect and I think that's what I really sort of liked I liked how easy it was going to a match you you turn up 15 minutes before you stand where you like um and then you can get out quickly you can you can you know you can get into your car quickly you can get on the the bus home easily um it, it was all just very easy and, and safe really to go along and that's still very much the case now of course with non league um you know it really is when you sort of look back on it it really is sort of a, a sort of you know, great sort of memories and, and sort of almost like a, a privilege really to be part of sort of a, a club and, and be part of something and, and go along every every weekend. Um, yeah, certainly certainly special, you know, supporting a, a non-league side and, and going to football for for the first time really um, for me, I think. Um, let's move on to our football programmes, popular talking point uh, as ever. We... Uh, answered the question a little bit earlier about non-league programmes and there's one here now talking about the future of, of non-league programmes which we, which we did touch on a little bit Tony didn't we but um, I think this is probably the, the sort of other argument really for, for football programmes really in, in terms of putting them together the, the costs involved the time involved um, particularly at non-league level and for 
for volunteers. Um, it, and in the digital age, of course, a lot of clubs move to to online programs, um, and perhaps the benefit of that is that maybe they're they're free, which which is possible. Um, they can be accessed by supporters if who aren't going to matches. Um, but I think the the future of football programs perhaps is a little bit like the future of newspapers in in the sense that it is a little bit of a dying breed and a little bit of a dying industry. Um, and it is all moving a little bit towards online and the, the digital age. But I think there is always a place for them. Um, and I think there is still that love for people of going to a game and, and picking up a hard copy of a, of a programme, going to a news agent on a, on a Sunday morning and, and picking up a hard copy of a paper. I think there is still demand for it. And as we were saying earlier, it's about the... The sort of tradition of football really going to football and getting a football program um now of course i i totally appreciate that you know there may be some people watching this who are involved with with clubs and, and perhaps put a program together or are involved in in the running costs of a football club and, and will argue that you know the costs involved aren't worth it but i think it's it's also part of the experience tony I, it's probably something you'd back me up on really you know when you go to football you you probably almost sort of expect a, a program to be there um, to, to, to be able to purchase a program and, and sort of learn about the club and, and the game that's on show. Um, so I do, I, I do hope, and I do think that there will always be a place for, for football programs, but I do accept that, that times are changing. Um, and certainly it's, it's perhaps not the same demand as there once was, or perhaps the same sort of love from, from clubs at the same time to put one together. Yeah, I see the, the arguments. I mean, particularly at the moment during the pandemic, um, a lot of clubs have gone to an online programme because uh, you don't want to be handling loose change. You don't want to be handling pieces of paper uh, and, and, and so on because of the risks involved. Um, but once we resume normality, I'm hoping that, that non-league programmes come back with a bang because it's just a, a magnificent keepsake of your visit to a non-league club. Now, you, you made some good points there. The first one about cost. Clubs are saying it costs too much money to produce a programme. They're losing money on it. Well, firstly, there is a company called Barnes Print in East Anglia who will produce non-league programmes free of charge. And I've been to non-league games where the programmes arrive from Barnes Print. They're packaged up. They're free of charge to the clubs. Barnes Print keep all the advertising revenue and they work like that. They deliver them to the clubs. Clubs just got to sell them. So even if you sell one copy, you've made a profit. So that's one of the arguments about the cost. Um, the second is about online uh, programs. You can have more of a presence online. I can I can understand that because uh, instead of selling maybe 50 programs on a match day, your online program is viewed by people all over the world. So I can understand that argument as well. I mean, one of the things they could do with programs is to include them in the admission costs. So at the say a step five or step six club where you pay five pounds to get in, maybe charge six pounds and then everybody gets a program and that's where the programs um, will be distributed. Um, and going back to my other idea about football for a tenor, certainly the match program would be included in that match day package. And the other thing, of course, is that if you sell enough advertising and sponsorship, then the program should wash its own face. You know, you can um, have a, a program sponsor. Uh, a lot of clubs have got a link with a local printer, whereby the printer will produce the programs free of charge in exchange for sponsoring the program or having a big advert, say, on the back cover. So there are lots of different ways around it. I can understand all the arguments, but as a, an old school traditionalist, I'd like to see programs continue. So uh, hopefully they will. Let's move on to the next one now. I think we'll, we'll have a couple more questions before we have a little break. Uh, from Robert Reed um, in the Republic of Ireland. And he says, after parting company with Jim Gannon, who appeared to be doing a fine job, Stockport County said the decision centered around culture. What's your interpretation of that? Well, that's a very difficult question to answer because obviously there is something behind the scenes, behind closed doors, that has led to this decision. Um, obviously, Stockport bouncing back after being relegated all the way down to the National League North. 
coming back into the National League. And I think they were placed quite high in the National League when they parted company with Jim Gannon, who uh, is a real good Stockport County man and a real character as well. I've interviewed him in the past and he's very, very passionate. And Stockport are, are, are a great club. Uh, I can remember them in the early part of this century, what, 2001, 2002, they were in what is now the equivalent of the championship. So uh, I remember one season, uh, they were in the same division as Manchester City and they gave Manchester City a couple of good games that season. And, and at uh, Edgeley Park, there was a huge crowd uh, when they played against um, Manchester City that season, which I think was 2001, 2002. And uh, a great club, very loyal support. Uh, I think the uh, the Weatherfield County team on that we hear about on Coronation Street, I think they're based um, loosely on Stockport County. So they've got a, a place in, um, in, in football, football folklore as well. Uh, I've always enjoyed going to Stockport. Um, it's a lovely little stroll down through the town centre from the railway station into the ground, lovely old ground, old stands and so on. So I'm not quite sure. What, what do you think, David, th this decision about Jim Gannon centred around culture? What, what could that mean? Yeah, it certainly came as a shock, that departure of Jim Gannon, like you say, Tony, of having a very fine season in, in National League and also in the, in the FA Cup. Um, yeah, it's, it's a difficult one to answer, really, without being <laughs> on the inside of, of the club. Um, what I will say is that Jim Gannon, from, from the times of spoken to him um, you know even even before their game against West Ham a, a few weeks ago you know was a seemed to me a very respectable respectful um, person um, the, the last couple of bill based national game awards which the non-league paper puts on um, his Stockport County sound sides of have won the Fair Play Award, which is um, the fewest yellow cards and red cards and, and discipline points um, across the whole of non-league, which I think for an ex a successful side, but also at the same time to, to do that twice in a row, that, you know, it's not, not a coincidence at all. So I think that goes to show, um, you know, what, what he likes is his teams and, and perhaps what he likes a, a club to be based around, which is a, an interesting point. Um, but no, clearly something has, has happened here. Um, and you know we, we probably will never find out quite what went on um, and you know Stockport have, have appointed Simon Rusk Brighton's under 23 manager um, who's made a, a pretty good start to, to life there so you know the the world keeps turning really but yeah certainly it's a surprise to to hear that one about Jim Gannon but I'm sure um, you know someone like him won't be out of the game for too long uh, moving on to our 10th question, I think this might be our, our final one before we have a, a little break, Tony. Um, Paul says, is it right that well-run clubs like Dulwich are being asked to go into debt by their league in order to complete their season? Um, so this is obviously involving the current situation at steps one and two um, over the vote, as we discussed, and, and the grants and loans debate. Um, whether clubs are being asked to go into debt by the league, I'm not quite sure whether that's the case, but it certainly isn't a good look for loans to be almost the only option alongside possible grants from Sport England if clubs are eligible for that. Um, but I guess this comes back to the point as to why clubs wouldn't want to continue playing the season because they don't want to take on loans. They don't want to kick the can, kick the problem down the down the road for, for a later day. Um, as mentioned, clubs like Hereford, clubs like Chesterfield, who have had their, uh, not Chesterfield, Chester, who have had their problems in the past, in their article of associations, they can't take on debt. They can't be having loans. Um, so that, that's sort of the problems they face. And a club like Dulwich, who were one of the ones who were a bit upset about the way the initial funding had been distributed amongst National League clubs, um, you know, will certainly feel that their finances have already been stretched this season. Um, and clearly a loan, um, you know, wouldn't be the answer for them uh, in order for the season to be completed. I, I don't think the National League is certainly asking clubs that they have to take on a loan and take on debt to, to finish the season. Um, I don't think that is the case, but clearly the, the situation that the 
clubs are in and the problem that they're facing um, isn't ideal that loans is one of the main solutions in order for the season to be finished. Um, so again, a, a very tricky situation. Um, and like we said, one we, we covered a little bit earlier in, in this chat, but Tony, is there anything more to add on on the loans and grants debate? Well, you make some really good points there. And um, as we said before, no football club should be forced into a, a situation where their future is in doubt. And I think Dulwich Hamlet have been very, very vocal about the whole situation on Twitter. And they have had a lot of problems in the past, haven't they? Losing the ground, being locked out of the ground, getting back in. And uh, a very, very um, burgeoning support base there. I mean, I can remember 20 years ago, Dulwich Hamlet would be lucky to get a couple of hundred people at their games but now they get a couple of thousand and they have those ultras behind the goal who are tremendous characters and have a, a wide array of, of songs um it, it's a fantastic old club anyway dating back to the days of edgar kale playing for them a uh, hundred years ago and so on um and it, it's a case of the people uh, reclaiming the game because I think um, at clubs like Dulwich and, and Clapton as well and Clapton Community uh, they've suddenly started attracting much bigger crowds and these ultras coming along because people see it as an affordable day out as a as a social day out and they're really enjoying it and it's uh, it, it, it's really nice to see the people reclaiming the game at non-league level and there are other clubs around the, the country West Didsbury up in the Manchester area and so on with ultras. I've, I've really enjoyed going to games where there has been a good atmosphere generated by this new breed of, of non-league supporters. So you don't want, with, with Dulwich having worked so hard to build up their crowds and everything else, you don't want to see their future in jeopardy. And um, I can understand what they're saying and I can understand where the club are coming from. And I, again, I can, I can see both sides of the argument because everybody wants to continue playing. But I'll give you an example. Uh, one of my early involvements in football was with a now defunct club in South London, just down the road from Dulwich Hamlet, called Fisher Athletic, who um, folded and went bust two or three times. And when some money came in, the money would be spent straight away. Uh, whenever they got any money from anywhere, it would be spent straight away. And it was normally spent on players and um, money would be coming in, money would be going out straight away. They wouldn't pay uh, bills straight away because they were paying their players and so on. And it's very, very difficult at non-league football because it's a hand-to-mouth existence and money goes as quickly as it comes in. And then if you asked a club like the old Fisher Athletic to suddenly repay all that money in six months' time or a year's time, they wouldn't have had a chance of doing it. And I'm sure, I mean, Fisher went bust two or three times now. It's a totally different club playing down there. But um, I'm sure Dulwich Hamlet are, are a lot better run than the old Fisher Athletic. But... Um, it would be very, very difficult to insist that clubs have to repay money in the future because the money might have, have gone by then. So I just think, obviously, the future of non-league clubs is paramount. And, and, and I'm amazed that a lot of non-league clubs haven't already gone bust because they haven't had, any, uh, haven't had much income coming in for 12 months. So let's not put any club in jeopardy. And, and, and clubs like Dulwich Hamlet, let's hope that they're still going for many, many years to come. So I think that's the, the first half of our questions. I think we're going to take a little break now. We'll be back in a few minutes. And um, hopefully um, for those of you watching online, please feel free to uh, ask a question using the question and answer function. But in the meantime, we'll be back in, in a few minutes. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. So let's have the next question, which comes from Piccadilly Football Club who play in the London Underground League, which is a great league taking place on weekday afternoons. And they say, what is the bare minimum a club needs to reach in terms of finances and facilities to run themselves and join the National Non-League Pyramid? So I'll start with that one. And um, what you need to join the National Pyramid at step six is an enclosed ground, with floodlights, a railed off pitch, with a stand and some covered uh, accommodation. I think 50 seats and, and 50 cover is the basic minimum at step six and floodlights. And uh, 
I think clubs coming up from what has previously been called step seven have been given uh, a year's grace um, to get their facilities up to scratch. And most of them have managed to do that. Um, it's very, very difficult because the cost of floodlights in particular is a lot for a community football club. I think it's around about £60,000 these days. And I think um, there are grants available. Obviously, the Football Foundation are really, really good at ploughing money in. But a lot of clubs who've come up to step six end up ground sharing because they can't build a non-league ground from scratch. They normally play on park pitches or recreation grounds. And it's been very, very difficult for them to create a step six ground. Although it can be done as a team in Kent called Glebe Football Club who did build a non-league ground from scratch. They took over a football pitch, I think, as part of a defunct rugby club. And they suddenly enclosed it with wooden fencing. They, they installed a stand. They installed um, a rail around the pitch. Hard standing as well. That's another aspect that's needed, as well as, obviously, the, uh, the dressing rooms have to have a certain number of shower facilities and so on. And the referee's changing room has to be a certain size and dimension. Uh, a lot of things have to be done to get to senior football at step six and, and move up through the pyramid. It is a lot of money and very, very difficult for clubs. But those who do achieve the ground grading requirements then have those facilities for life and can move forward to move up to step five. You might have to add an extra 50 seats and so on. And to keep moving up, you have to improve the facilities all the way along. I mean, a, a billionaire could buy a piece of land uh, a field and suddenly start creating his own football team and start enclosing the ground and start putting stands up and could progress all the way from park football and win promotion every year. It costs a lot of money in terms of players once you start climbing the pyramid, but it, it is possible. And if they could breach the Premier League if they built up a stadium that became bigger and bigger along the way. Um, it, it's very difficult, though. It's going to cost a lot of money. Um, what do you feel, David? Yeah, it's a difficult one, making that transition into semi-professional football. I, I did a piece with uh, Golko United, um, who are currently in, who have recently joined Step 6. Have you been up there yet, Tony? No, it's on my list. Um, I have um, 50 clubs still to visit at Step uh, 6 and uh, 5 at Step 5. And Golko are up in the, uh, I think they're in the Huddersfield area, aren't they, around about that area? Um, certainly on my list of clubs to visit and... Um, They've been in touch. They've reached out and said, you're always welcome. And they seem a very good uh, community club going forward. Um, so, yeah, it's one to visit, David. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I did, yeah, I did a piece with them um, not too long ago. and I was just sort of talking to their manager about how they were able to join the pyramid, basically, and all, and all sort of the, the, the things they had to do. They had to do quite a lot of work on, on their ground there, but um, they certainly have the ambition. But it, did, it was sort of a little bit of an eye-opener, really, as to what clubs have to do. Um, but like you say, Tony, there are resources out there for, for clubs to use in, in terms of getting that funding. And um, I think perhaps ground grading gets a little bit of a, a reputation, maybe, you know, a bad reputation perhaps for you know in, enforcing these sort of changes onto clubs but i think it's necessary for the pyramid um you know i i think it is it helps raise standards uh, across the board if there wasn't ground grading you know that extra money would be spent on a center forward in, instead of a a new terrace or a, or a new stand which um you know will last much longer than than, than a player signing um, and it, yeah, like I said, it raises standards across the board. Um, and ultimately, if these things are in place and if you enjoy going to a non-league ground where the terrace isn't crumbling from beneath your feet, you're, you're going to want to go back. And I think that's what clubs should aim for. Um, you know, you do speak to chairman. I always remember Mark Harris, the, the chairman of the Northern Premier League, said to me once, he said, um, you know, I always say to my clubs, get your ground sorted first and then focus about what's going on with your team. Because once your ground's in place, you'll have that for X amount of years and you can play at the level and you can then come and, and be sustainable on the pitch. And I think he, he's spot on with that. Um, but clearly, yeah, it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a, a jump certainly to, to join the non-league pyramid, but um, 
I always look at the ones that do, and, and the Golka one certainly sticks out in my mind as a, as a club who are, who are really enjoying that challenge and, and really enjoying trying to um, improve their ground and, and club. Um, so yeah, that's, that's my my feelings on that one. Um, our friend Mr. Up has, has been back in touch with our next question, saying, should the non-league season continue during the current pandemic? Um, which is a little bit open-ended and, and, and uh, what we sort of touched on really in, in earlier on in, in our chat here. Um, but I suppose perhaps it, it maybe brings up the moral argument of whether football should be still being played in, in this time, um, particularly when the pandemic has been at its worst and, and case and, and death rates are sadly at, at their highest. Um, you know, should football be carrying on when all of this is going on? Um, I think what I would, would say is that the, the impact football has up and down the country, no matter what level you have, is is certainly a great one on on communities and supporters and, and people involved. Um, and so I think it is um, it's, it's been a big part, I think, probably of of, of lockdown and, and helping people get through this time, being able to give them a a way out, a, a break from almost re- reality in, in a sense and, and being able to watch matches um, continue to feel a part of something continue supporting their team like they would usually would do um, you know whether this is ref- this question is, is sort of referring to the current situation at steps one and two um, clearly that's up for the up for the clubs to decide and, and obviously there's a similar situation at the moment um, at step three and below in terms of what will happen with their season. I think clearly for those levels, the Eastman League, Northern Premier uh, and Southern League, they've, they've been very forthright, the league, in, in saying they wouldn't be playing matches without crowds because simply it's, it's not sustainable. Um, they've gone a little bit further in, in that aspect in saying that um, they wouldn't restart either whether... Uh, the secondary spend was in place, so clubhouses w- were allowed to be open, bars, etc. Um, because we did see that with the tier system, where fans may be allowed in, but they couldn't be buying food, buying drinks at a ground. They had to have it outside, which was a uh, fairly sort of strange and, and, and bizarre ruling, I think. Um, although some local authorities do allow their clubs um, to operate that secondary spend, but it's certainly certainly hit those on these sides. Tony, any thoughts on this one? Yeah, I mean, we, we've touched on steps one and two, haven't we? The National League and the National League North, and we've discussed that. Steps three to step six, uh, there is money available. They're going to get grants. Um, I think at step three, it's going to be £25,000 and so on. Um, my own view on this, it might be a controversial view, is to wait and see what happens with the next announcement by the Prime Minister, which is scheduled for February the 22nd, because I think he's going to lift the lockdown and maybe into March the lockdown will be lifted um, quite considerably. Most of the really vulnerable people have already been vaccinated, I think 80% now of the over 70s and so on. And uh, in another month's time, maybe all the over 60s will have been vaccinated and the death rate and the infection rate might be very, very much lower than it is now. So could we restart the season in March or maybe in April? That would mean that the clubs would have to play through the summer, which wouldn't be a bad thing um, if they could if they could organise it. So maybe we could play, I mean, there'd be a massive catch up, particularly leagues like the Northwest Counties League, where they've hardly played any fixtures. But if we played through April, May, June and July and then had the close season in August and restarted next season in the middle of September, I think that would work. And we'd have summer football, um, which they have tried in other countries. You know, they've tried it in the Republic of Ireland and it's been a real success because there are nice summer days where you can go out and have a drink and, and watch your local football team and um, kids can go along and so on. You don't have to stand in the freezing cold. There has been an argument, when I put this forward on Twitter, there has been an argument, oh, what about cricket? What about the clubs that share with cricket? Well, I think there are only probably in the whole of the non-league top six tiers, probably only a half a dozen clubs that actually uh, share with cricket. I can I can think of teams like Stourbridge, Lytown, Hoddesdon. It's no more 
than 10 at the most, probably half a dozen. And those clubs do have an overlap with cricket at the very start of the season and at the very end of the season. And what they tend to do if they're drawn at home in the FA Cup or whatever, they'll play their fixture on a Friday night or on a Sunday. And there isn't really a problem. The other argument that has been put forward, and I don't have a, a technical knowledge of this, is, well, when will the grass grow? If we're playing football all through the summer, when will the grass be tended? When will it grow? And I, I can't answer that one because I'm not the groundsman. Um, but again, they get by in the Republic of Ireland and they play all through the summer and they switch from a winter season about 15 years ago. And it's a big, big success. Um, so my uh, opinion is let's just wait and see what happens with the lockdown. Will it be too late to restart the season? Not if we're going to play through the summer. And I think you'd be surprised by how big the crowds are at every level of the non-league pyramid if, if we played our fixtures in June and July. And it might be the start of something for the future, an argument about permanent summer football. We'll have to wait and see. But in the meantime, yes, health, safety, loved ones must come first. So it, it's a very difficult situation uh, at the moment. Um, just while I'm on, we have um, some people in the room. Uh, welcome to Alan, John Cotton, Russell Cox and Stuart. Stuart has a question. How are clubs in the National League who don't have any sponsors or income going to survive? I, I think you've just joined the room, Stuart. We did touch on this in the first part, but we'll, we'll have a recap. Um, it's all to do with um, the uh, grants and loans argument. And um, it is very, very difficult for the clubs because they thought that they were going to get grants that they didn't have to pay back. And they're going to uh, maybe get loans, which will have to be paid back. Uh, paid back in the future and uh, that is causing a lot of clubs to say that's not sustainable. Um, uh, David has already expanded on this but that's the main argument isn't it David? Yeah that's right yeah grants and, and, and loans and, and the current situation at steps one and two um, you know not ideal for, for anyone I think uh, you know most clubs do have sponsors in, in the National League um, obviously income is the issue without crowds um, and the loans or grants would effectively uh, cover that in theory. But um, yeah, without knowing sort of the full details as, as in terms of the funding process and the application process that clubs have to go into, it's a tricky one to answer. And, and it's clearly the, the big debate at, at the moment in, in non-league. Thanks, David. And uh, anybody else in the room who'd like to ask a question, please use the Q and A function at the bottom of the page. The next question is from Withenshaw Amateurs Football Club of the North West Counties League, a two-part question. Should all Step 6 and above clubs be automatically entered into the FA Cup, given the time, effort and expense clubs go to in order to reach that level? And should the FA Amateur Cup be reintroduced for feeder league clubs and below? Well, two parts. Firstly, I think we've already um, answered about the FA Cup. It would be great to have more and more non-league clubs involved, but it's just a question of when do you play these extra, extra, extra preliminary rounds that have to be played all through the summer. And it's very, very difficult. The uh, first round, as David was saying, has to be played at a time when the television coverage is uh, in place and then the third round of the FA Cup has to be played in January. So it, it would be very difficult. It'd be great to get more non-league clubs involved in the FA Cup. Um, I personally, you know, like to see some of the very early past winners allowed back into the FA Cup. They wouldn't have the facilities, but they would have a, a, a great pedigree in history. The old Carthusians and the old Etonians who still play in the Arthurian League, Clapham Wanderers, who reached the FA Cup final in the 1880s, they still play at a low level of football in uh, Surrey. It's a reformed club. And the original Wanderers have reformed and play in the old checkered shirts as well. Um, it'd be great to see them all invited back in as a one-off. Um, uh, but, but when you play these extra, extra, extra preliminary rounds, I, I don't know. Um, the other thing is, should the FA Amateur Cup be reintroduced for feeder league clubs and below? Well, this is interesting. And this is... a um, a subject I've thought about in the past, we have the Build Base FA Trophy and we have the Build Base FA Bars. Uh, obviously, to play in those competitions, you need enclosed grounds with floodlights and so on. Um, the original FA Amateur Cup used to embrace a lot of clubs below the current FA Vars level. There were teams like City of Norwich, Old Boys, Union, who played 
in the um, FA Amateur Cup. And indeed, I think they played in the uh, the early years of the the uh, FA Vars before it became all floodlit. I can remember clubs from the Amateur Football Association playing in national competitions. East Barnet Old Grammarians Q Association. I can remember playing in the um, in the FA Amateur Cup and and then in the early FA uh, Vars as well. Um, and there were some good results from those clubs because um, at very low uh, levels of, of the non-league pyramid and in um, in amateur football, alliance football, a lot of players um, are of a good standard. They don't want to join a semi-professional non-league club and, and have to travel halfway across the southeast of England to play a match for £50 on a Saturday and then get back late in the evening, at 8, 9 o'clock, uh, when they've got young families and so on. They prefer to play with their mates in a in a team in the Southern Amateur League or the Amateur Football Combination and get home at six o'clock on a Saturday because all the games are fairly local. And a lot of these guys as well at that level have got good jobs. They work in banks and so on. They don't need to play for a semi-pro non-league team at step six for 50 quid. Uh, they just want to play with their friends and, and have a drink after the game and go home. So some of these teams at a low level are of a very good standard. And it would be nice to see them playing on a national stage. Now, obviously, the bill base FA Vars, which goes down to step six and well, it's, it's step five and step six and some step seven teams, it's all floodlit, it's all enclosed grounds. So could we actually have, and this is this is something I've been thinking about, could we actually have a competition below the bill base FA Vars. How about an FA Earn, for example, um, where teams at, well, step seven and below really, uh, play on a national stage. Um, you could have it as part of non-league finals day. The final could be at Wembley and there could be a lot of interest. It, it, it's food for thought and it's something I'd like to see. Um, I think we've got the Capital uh, Counties Trophy, haven't we, in the London area at the moment for Step 7 and below, which I think when that first started, that was going to become like a national competition. It, it's still based around the South East. But, yeah, I'd like to see... So I, I, I don't think it would be called the FA Amateur Cup anymore because there's no amateur football. People are just footballers now. That was the distinction that was abolished when the FA Amateur Cup stopped and the, the Bill Base FA Trophy and the Bill Base FA Vars took over. But, yes, I think... David, I don't know how you feel, but I'd like to see another national competition below for step seven and below uh, with all the really small teams taking part. Yeah, spot on, Tony. I'm not actually sure but there's much I can add on that. I think you've, I think you've nailed it there. Um, I think all it will take is just someone in a, an administrative role somewhere to, to just sort of step up and, and try and push that forward, really. But um, no, I, I think you're right with, with everything you've, you've said there. So, um, yeah, on, on to the next question, I think, uh, which is from Ramsgate FC, who say many clubs have an aging fan base and associated volunteers. How vital is it to attract the younger crowd away from EFL and Premier League in order to ensure essential and often unnoticed tasks are carried out by the future generations? Um, yeah, it's it's crucial that non-league attracts a younger audience. And I think, in fairness, from my experience over recent years, when you go to the games, there are uh, young people there, and, and they and they really do get behind um, their club. It's almost sort of the atmosphere is, is generated really by a, by a younger crowd, um, and it is very promising to see that. And it is about attracting these these younger fans um because ultimately they will be the ones tasked with with doing these uh jobs on a, on a match day on the turnstiles in the tea hut etc um but i've i've been i've been pretty uh pretty positive about the way, way things are way things are heading from from my experiences i think i, I think again it, like we were talking about earlier tony i think it goes back to the affordability and and the accessibility of, of, of non-league and, and local teams, I think. I think it's easy for young people to, to get involved. Um, don't know how, how much I should be saying it, but it perhaps gives them a little bit more freedom on, on a match day um, to, to, to get up to one, to one or two things and, and perhaps enjoy it a, a little bit more in, in that aspect. But no, I, I certainly see um, 
normally very much attracting a, a younger audience. And I, and I think for the ones I've seen, they certainly seem to enjoy going to, to matches and, and that's great to see. So certainly how I felt when I when I first started going to one of the games. Tony, what what about you? Yeah, you make some good points. And I've had a lot of youngsters reaching out to me on Twitter who are volunteers, mainly on the media side for non-league clubs. Because if I was a youngster now and I wanted to get into the media, um, a good way to do this is to approach your local non-league club and get involved on the press side of things. So write match reports for the programme, get involved with the website, with the Twitter, help with the match day commentary, because a lot of clubs at the moment are doing live feeds and so on. And it's a really good way of getting involved in the world of journalism, getting to meet other more experienced journalists and, and get involved and uh, play your part in the local community. You know, it's a yeah, great... That, I mean, that's, that's how, sorry, Tony, sorry to jump in there, but that's, that's how I started with, with Waking, actually. Um, you know, I volunteered to, to write match reports for their website. Um, and, and sort of from being around those circles, you get to know the, the, you know, the local newspaper journalists um, Etc. You know, I was roped into filming ma matches for the for the club's YouTube uh, highlights, which uh, you know I didn't have any experience of doing that before. But you know, it, it was great being thrown into doing those things. So yeah, certainly an avenue um, from 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 that aspect for people as well. Sorry for jumping in there. Sir. No, no problem at all. I've got to say as well, my um, most embarrassing moment as a a non-league follower and a non-league journalist came um, involving youngsters because I went to a match about three, four years ago at New Toxeter Town in the Midlands. It was a build base FA Vars match on a Sunday against Barden Hill. And uh, New Toxeter had a great policy of letting all youngsters under 16 into the ground free of charge. So at every home game, 50 or 60 youngsters were coming and they had their own stand behind the goal, which they took over and they were singing all through the game and they had... Um, pyrotechnic flares and so on um, and lots of musical instruments, uh, trumpets and, and really creating a good atmosphere and I thought this was a great policy. The club were really uh, pushing uh, the, the youth and, and these, these kids will become future supporters. I, I became a non-league supporter when I was 10 years old. I'm still going to non-league football now so absolutely fantastic. So at the end of the game I asked the kids to pose for a photograph holding their pyrotechnic flares in the air, they had these blue flares, and it was a really dramatic photograph uh, with all this blue smoke sailing into the sky and all these kids um, taking part in this photograph. So I put it on my Twitter. So the next day, the club, you talked to the town, got uh, an email from their local county football association, the Staff Stafford Staffordshire Football Association, uh, saying you are charged with failing to control your fans and you have been fined 25 pounds for failing to control the crowd at a non-league match and attached to this charge sheet on the email was my tweet my photograph from twitter and i was absolutely mortified in fact i sent a message to the staffordshire fa saying look please don't do this you know the club are doing their best um but they were they were fined twenty five pounds and very very embarrassing really it's only a, a nominal sum of money but for a non league club that's uh, that's still money that they have to find and a fine that they have to pay so uh, I was trying my best to promote <laughs> the youth of today football there you go and it was a very embarrassing moment but uh, a good policy at Utox to everybody allowed in for free I think. Um, everybody under sixteen allowed in for free other clubs uh, let kids in for a pound. And uh, if they're accompanied by adults as well, it means their mum and dad can come along and, and they'll spend money in the bar. And it, it's a win-win situation for everybody. And then hopefully those young fans will become hooked at an early age and become the non-league supporters of the future. So uh, that's that question. Let's move on to this next one from non-league blogs. Any thoughts on a future round robin tournament for the National League, National League North, and National League South teams? Um, I assume he is suggesting that the League Cup, the League Cup, uh, David, hasn't been in existence for a few years, has it? I think. Uh, no, I don't think so. I, I don't know whether this question is sort of maybe aimed at, um, you know, if if the if the season at step two or if the season at step one came to an early end, whether 
clubs would organise some clubs who wanted to play organised to some sort of friendly tournament. Um, I know that has definitely been talked about lower down the pyramid, um, and in some cases it's even happened. Um, little sort of round robin friendly tournaments, um, you know, providing clubs are happy to to play and, and, and things like that, which you know I certainly think is is you know is a good idea, providing everything's. Uh, everything's okay and, and, and the clubs want to do that um, you know it, it could certainly be a, a situation where steps three and four won't have played from probably the end of October October 31st start of November um, right right until the new season obviously they would have a pre-season but you know that was a long time to go without any sort of competitive football so yeah I mean putting on a some sort of round robin tournament um you know, would help to manage that. And and obviously, you know, if that becomes the case in, in step two or, or step one, then, you know, it seems like a, a good idea providing the, the clubs are happy and the players are happy to, to do that. I'm sure a lot of players are, you know, getting itchy feet at the moment, wanting, wanting to get out and, and play football. We've seen a lot of step three players make the step up to step two Um during this time, whilst their season is, is currently paused um, in order to play games, signing on dual registration, signing on loan, um, etc. So, yeah, it's certainly one to keep an eye on. And I would not be surprised at all to see some sort of mini tournaments where maybe clubs chip in for a, a trophy at the end of it, at least um, to, to go ahead. And, and who knows, maybe then that might spur on something else in, in, in the normal season. Yeah, I think there was a, a small tournament in the Worcestershire area. I remember uh, just after Christmas, Worcester Raiders were going to play a couple of games in it. And um, I think then there was a further lockdown and that stopped. Uh, there's also been a suggestion, David, I don't know how much you know about this, from Gloucester City, that there should be a mini promotion league at the end of the season to just see who wins promotion. What, what have you, you heard about that? Yeah, I saw that. That was an interesting proposal put forward. I guess clubs are, you know, putting things out there to try and get a little bit of attention and, and then perhaps for leagues to see that there might be some interest in, in these things. I, I think it goes back as well to steps three and four, where if there is a situation in March where fans are, are allowed back in and the secondary spend is there, clearly they won't be able to finish their season as they we usually would. So they might have to come up with a, a different way of completing the season, which might be splitting the league in half or, or regionalising the league and, and playing games that way and then having some sort of grand final at the end of it. Um, so these are the, the different scenarios, I suppose, that, that could happen if leagues and, and administrators are, are prepared to think outside the box a little bit. And I think that is, I think probably at this moment in time, it, it is something that leagues should should be thinking about and perhaps gauging some some sort of interest um among their clubs about it okay would you like to ask the next question shall i crack on with the ne next yeah. one from uh, hatfield town um if they were many grassroots clubs folding due to covid19 how will the fa support those left that are struggling financially with businesses not in a position to support grassroots football clubs with sponsorship how will non-league clubs survive without support from the FA? Um, so I think looking at grassroots clubs, yeah, it's, it's obviously different from the, the semi-professionals and professional levels um, further up the, the non-league pyramid, um, where obviously at steps three and four, the, the grant money is coming from the government. Um, and, and at steps one and two, have had, had that support as well. Um, grassroots is, is, I think, historically, Tony, an issue that has rumbled on for a while. And the, I think the argument has always been that with the money that comes in from the um, TV deals at, at, in the top flight in the Premier League, it's why that, why not enough of that money is, is put back down into the lower reaches of the game and, and grassroots. And I know that the, the FA and the Football Foundation, etc., have really pushed... Um, you know, grassroots funding and things like that over the years, but there's certainly more that can be done, I think. And it's perhaps um, building or creating facilities that will last for a while. Um, things like 3G pitches, 
um, you know, where in other countries they're very much ahead of the game and, and there's 3G pictures everywhere and, and can be used all day and night um, by local communities and, and, and youngsters to, to play on those. Um, I think that, I think for me, that's the big thing, 3G pictures, getting those down in, in communities and in areas and counties, having at least one of those available for, for everyone to use. Um, you know, I know 3G pictures get a lot of stick um, towards the t towards the higher levels of, of non-league, but I think at grassroots uh, level, they're a, a fantastic facility to use, um, you know, park pictures these days, you know, from my own experiences playing on a Sunday morning still, you know, they aren't in the best of uh, condition, um, you know, likewise goal nets and, and, and things like that. Um, so there's still still a lot more that can be done at the grassroots level. Um, I still hold out hope that you know the FA are still working towards putting a lot more in, into grassroots. Um, you know, because I, I think fundamentally grassroots is the lifeblood of the game. I suppose you know every professional player that we see, every non-league player, would have started out in an under 12 team somewhere in on their local park in the, you know wherever that may be um so we need we need grassroots standards to be high um and by putting in better facilities and having more funding into grassroots it will only benefit the game across the country i think for me tony what about you yeah you made some great points again and um firstly the, the question is worded with many grassroots clubs folding due to COVID-19. Well, I don't think there've been that many. There've only been, I'd say less than 10 clubs have folded, um, certainly in, in, in the major part of the non-league pyramid. Um, and I'm really surprised that hundreds and hundreds of clubs, senior non-league clubs haven't gone bust. And I think it's only because of the efforts of the volunteers that have kept everything going because there's been no income coming in through the turnstiles, no income through the bar facilities. Sponsors have, have cut back. They haven't got the money. And yet clubs still have to pay their rent, their utility bills and so on. They still have to look after the pitches and so on. And it, it's been really difficult. And I'm really surprised, um, but very, very pleased that, that hundreds of senior non-league clubs haven't gone bust. And down into grassroots level, I've only heard of a few that have folded. So the situation could be a lot worse, but it's because the volunteers have kept things going. Now, the other point you made there about 3G pitches is spot on. Um, for a community football club, the installation of a 3G pitch, I think, is essential. Uh, it costs, what, four or five hundred thousand pounds, but the money is available from the Football Foundation. As you said, the Football Foundation are really big on supplying and rolling out these 3G pitches. And I think as a non-league club, firstly, from a match day point of view, if you've got a 3G pitch, unless there is a really extreme weather condition, your match is going to be on. So you know that you're gonna get that match day income. But then you can also have all your community teams based at the same place, at the same venue. You can have all their training sessions, you can have youth team games taking place on a Sunday morning at the main ground, Sunday afternoon, the women's teams playing there, all the training taking place at the main ground. You can also run an academy there based at the ground uh, with uh, an association with a local college who will provide education for young footballers who then train and play their matches maybe in the middle of a weekday afternoon on the main pitch. And then all of these people coming and going, visiting the, the main ground for their football and for their training sessions, their parents are there as well, using the bar facilities and so on. And I think it's a it's a money spinner and it, it really does help the future of non-league clubs, particularly if they want to be part of the community. Now, yes, you say that there is an argument against these 3G pitches because some people think it's an artificial standard of football. They think that the ball bounces erratically on these pitches but that's not really the case anymore it was in the with the first um the first wave of uh, artificial pitches was in the 1980s the early 1980s queens park rangers in 1981 uh, luton in 1982 preston and oldham they were the first four clubs in this country in the football league in the early 1980s they played on a surface which was called omniturf 
And I saw all the games at Queen's Park Rangers. It was like, and I wouldn't have admitted it at the time as a supporter, but it was like playing on concrete. The ball would bounce <laughs> and then bounce 20 foot up in the air over the goalkeeper's head or over a defender's head. People couldn't turn. Uh, they'd slide in to tackle and they would cut their legs. The pitch was, was rock hard. And in the end, slide tackles were were ruled out. If you misplaced the pass, the ball would, would bounce on the surface and, and run out of play on the far side really, really fast out over the touchline. Um, QPR were able to play some good football on it, but visiting teams didn't like it. And in the end, those artificial pitches were outlawed by the Football League uh, in 1988, I think it was, who QPR had to lift the pitch up and play it again on grass. So people remember that. But that's like comparing a mobile phone from the late 1980s with a mobile phone now. A mobile phone in the late 1980s was one of those big brick uh, things with a big <laughs> sticking out of it and you had to carry it around and uh, it, you couldn't fit it in your pocket. You look at a mobile phone now, it's like a mini computer. Um, it, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's called a smartphone for a reason. And the technology since the 1980s, and don't forget that, that picture QPR in 1981, that's quite 40 years ago. 40 years ago, the technology has moved on and now um, World Cup matches have been played um, on 3G pitches. I think England played out in Russia in an important game in the World Cup. Champions League games are played on artificial pitches. And that Champions League final between Chelsea and Manchester United was played on a, on a 3G pitch. You know, if it's good enough for international football for the Champions League, it should be good enough for, for non-league. But people have long memories. They remember the early 1980s pitches and, and they think the pitches now are like that. But they're not. They've got a soft, spongy surface now. The ball will bounce true. You can tackle. If you fall on it, uh, you won't hurt yourself. And I, I, I think the, these 3G pitches are the way forward for community non-league clubs. And as you said there, David, the funding is available from the Football Foundation. Um, OK, we've got a couple of questions left. So um, let me do the penultimate one and then David will do the last one. So West Auckland Town, what are the odds of playing the 2019-20 Build Base FA Vars final and completing the 2021 Build Base FA Vars competition if they decide the league is null and void again? Well, no one really knows the answer, but I have spoken to some high-level officials at the Football Association and they are um, committed to finishing last season's Build Base FA Bars final and indeed the Bill Base FA Trophy final with non-league finals day. It was going to take place, and, and David will confirm this, it was going to take place in the early part of this season, but then another lockdown came in and uh, they wanted to play it at Wembley and allow 10,000 people in and, and then there was a lockdown and we couldn't let fans in and then it was postponed once again. So I'm hoping that um, these competitions will be completed. Uh, they will take place at... Um, Wembley Stadium, we might have to have a, a double non-league finals day. That would be a great occasion, wouldn't it? If you had, you'd have to start very, very early in the morning. The first final would have to be at maybe 10 o'clock, half past 10, <laughs> then another one at lunchtime at one o'clock and another one at about four o'clock. And then you'd have to have an evening final. If you're going to play four finals in the one day, uh, it would be an all day jamboree at Wembley Stadium. But from what I can understand, um, I don't know what you've heard, David, but um, the FA are definitely committed to completing these two competitions. Yeah, that's that's certainly what they've maintained throughout this time. Um, yeah, to me, Tony, that it sounds like a pretty good idea to have, have those finals on the same day, providing um, you know the likes of of Concord, <laughs> the likes of um, some of those teams in the FA Vars don't reach the final again. Otherwise, they they, they might have a, have a little bit of a problem there. Um, but no, I mean, hopefully they do, and hopefully those teams have their have their big day out at Wembley. Um, you know, of course, if there's a crowd there, that that would make it uh, even better. But um, no, let let's hope they do. And uh, yeah, I like your idea of having a having multiple finals on the same day. Although I'm not too sure how much the the Wembley pitch maintenance crew would uh, be be fond of that one, Tony. But I'll, I'll leave you leave that for uh, for you to discuss with them. But um, no, hopefully we, we get that resolved. Um, should we move on to our last question, then, Tony? Yeah, should I, uh, I'll handle this one. Um, Paul says, "Is if there is no promotional relegation, how does non-league propose to fill the gaps in the leagues, or will they remain 
as is. Um, yeah, obviously a difficult one to answer. Um, I think what is worth pointing out is, is the gaps in non-league at the moment. Obviously, the National League is currently running with, with 23 teams. Um, only one side was relegated last year. Obviously, Macclesfield Town um, were liquidated. Uh, their Phoenix Club, Macclesfield FC, which certainly has some big plans, uh, will be looking to fill one of those gaps, but they'll have to start down in uh, step five and six um, and, and fill a gap there. Um, but in terms of in terms of what they do elsewhere in the pyramid, yeah, it's a difficult one, not knowing whether seasons are going to finish, uh, yeah, whether leagues are going to finish, what levels are going to finish. So, yeah, a difficult one, one to to keep an eye on, but certainly a, another headache for the administrators if if they needed another one to to try and sort that. And further down, um, there are one or two vacancies um, at the, the lower steps, uh, particularly, say, at step six. The, the leagues did try, um, one or two leagues did try to fill the vacancies. The Northwest Counties League, for example, um, brought in the new Berry Football Club and um, FC Isle of Man. FC Isle of Man couldn't play any games in the end because of the travelling problems for away teams to travel to and from the Isle of Man and the Isle of Man players to travel to the mainland, so it's difficult. Um, I wouldn't like to see ambitious clubs. I mean, there are some ambitious clubs below step six who've got their facilities up to scratch over the last couple of years and they've installed floodlights and stands and they haven't been able to move up the pyramid as yet. And uh, it's almost like everybody has been put on hold for, it'll be two years now uh, or two seasons. Um, so it's very difficult, but, but hopefully some of the ambitious clubs who want to come in at step six will be able to, to fill those little vacancies that exist at the moment. So anyway, uh, thanks, David. I think that covers all the topics. Thanks to everybody who logged in and everybody who asked questions. I Just to uh, finish off, I want to remind everybody that Build Base have launched the £50,000 Community Club Award Scheme for non-league clubs. There are two prizes of £25,000 worth of building materials available one lot of £25,000 for a club in the Build Base FA Trophy and one lot of £25,000 for a club in the Build Base FA Vars. You can apply now at buildbase.co.uk. The closing date is the 28th of March and good luck.